Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final keynote speech with Dr. Douglas Dawson, CEO of the Liberty Industries Group. Um, so before we get started and before I hand you over to Douglas, I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about him and uh, what his event will focus on today. Um, if you do have any questions, we will allow 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar and uh, we get, we'll get your, your questions answered then. So um, Dr. Douglas Dawson is a prominent Brit British business leader with a 30 year track record of achievement and success within the UK and international engineering, manufacturing and industry sectors. So Douglas's event today will focus on March 2020, fast forward to the future. Um, I will be here for any technical difficulties that we may be occurring. So um, if you are experiencing any of those, please reach out. However, I'll pass you over to Dr. D Douglas now. So thank you, everybody. Yasmin, thank you. Um, before I see or do anything else, I will mostly say today, I uh, would like to thank you, Yasmin, um, for you and the Backing Britain team for putting this on today. Um, and also to Laura Preston, who is our events manager in Liberty. Both of you have been working tirelessly behind the scenes and uh, the, uh, all these events don't happen easily and it's all that hard paddling under the water that uh, makes these events such an excess. So, so thank you. Um, we're just following on from uh, what Yasmin said there, perhaps I'll, uh, you know, that's perhaps the sterile version of, of who and what I am, but or what the business card might say. But Let's, uh, I'll pause for a moment and just tell you a bit about myself. Uh, you can probably hear that uh, I'm a, a Scot, a proud Scot, and, and a proud British citizen, I may add, because um, this uh, talk today is all about backing Britain. Um, mother and father, God-fearing Highlanders, uh, came down to Loch Lomond in 1961. Um, I popped out, was born in the house, and my father was a wood machinist. Um, he, uh, he and my mother worked, uh, he worked in, and we lived in a, a tied house in the banks of Loch Lomond. At the age of seven, um, my father got a job in Glasgow. Um, and let's just say we moved to a colorful part of Glasgow. And let's just say it was like the Waltons moving to the Wild West. <laughs> so um, the, uh, we grew up in an interesting, colorful, but a very loving childhood and very loving home. But sadly, I lost my father at 13 and that was the, let's just say the first piece of adversity in my life. Um, we all suffer adversity. We suffer it in personal life. We suffer it in business life. Um, and very much about what backing Britain is about is we're suffering adversity as a country. Um, I gained some skill at football. I signed for Celtic uh, when I was 13. But sadly, um, in the summer of 1976, for those of us who are old enough to remember, was baking hot. And I got a double cruciate ligament operation, damage, operation, and uh, football career over. So what do I do then? I joined the Navy and rose to the rank of Chief Engineering Officer with two pieces of adversity behind me. I then was on a career in the Navy, joined industry, PTR Industries back in the day, went to New York, worked for City Corps Venture Capital, large investment bank, came back to the UK, continued my industrial career, and five years ago, I, I joined um, Liberty, which is part of the GFG Alliance. It's a $26 billion organization now, diverse industrial group, um, led by Sanjeev Gupta, our chairman and my boss. Um, and that's where and how we've got to where we are today. But back in Britain, uh, business as usual, or should I say crisis as usual, and it's no laughing matter, but... Who would have thought, you know, on the 23rd of March, which is five months ago, who would have thought that the world would have parked itself in a lay-by um, and a railway siding, socio and economically for three months? Um, and as we've been emerging from lockdown, um, some of us may not feel we have been emerging from lockdown uh, with local lockdowns and we're trying to shape the future. We really don't have a playbook for this. And... On top of that, or behind that, or somewhere still lurking in our near-term future, there's an inconvenient little thing called Brexit, which um, almost feels like a bump in the road now. But that's very much at the heart of you know, what backing Britain should be all about. Yes, we're a divided country. Yes, different sections of the country voted in different ways, but we are a democratic country and a vote was cast. And that reality will 
come to bear towards the end, at the end of this year. And when you think financially, um, and you think about what the country's dealing with, and we were getting all excited about how much a hard Brexit would cost, and then the budget for that hard Brexit, and you look at what we've actually spent so far, when we talk about Britain's response economically to the COVID crisis, is that in terms of fiscal, you know, April to April fiscal year, and we had budgeted, say, 50 billion of borrowing as a country for the whole year, we'd already spent nearly 130 billion in the first three months, and were forecast for somewhere between 350 and 400 billion. And you marry that up in terms of money actually spent against a forecast or a budget of what a hard Brexit might do to our economic uh, future for the country. We're way, way past that already. So from a, an economic standpoint, you know, Brexit is very much, uh, you know, the poor relation and what we're trying to respond to. But when you look at how we've responded, and you look at, you know, and the government will come on to uh, perhaps a topic on government response uh, in my talk a bit later. But when you look at how we've responded, and you know, let's just say you look at our big, uh, our big cousin America, you know, what happens in America tends to happen here. You know, cheap flights started in America, they came over here. Uh, blockbuster video started in America, it came over here. So what do we look at? And you look at one of the big responses that we've had, it's the furlough scheme. Now, as an industrialist, um, and it's my view for what it's worth, I think it was a masterstroke. Um, there have been unintended consequences of it, but in terms of keeping the economy going, we now have employment at around, still around 4%. It's gone up, but 4% a few years ago would have been something we would have been proud of. America's currently at 11, but it perhaps gives us a sneaky peek into what the future might hold for us as the furlough scheme starts to wind down and industrialists like myself and those of you who have kindly joined us today, you will come from many sectors, but the common thing above across all sectors generally is that we employ people and it's people that are at the heart of who and what we are and what we do as a business. And as that furlough scheme unwinds and the unintended consequence of the COVID crisis is that how do we look at our organizations and how do we shape them for the future? And it's kind of given us a sneaky peek at how efficient and how lean our organizations can be. And for those people who are still in employment, um, and again, an unintended consequence will be that sadly, all people will not come back to work. But for those people that are coming to work, and if you ask me, could you give me the next slide, please? The trip to work has changed. Work has changed. How we perceive work has changed. If you were to ask me maybe a year ago, um, you know, and it, I guess we all had this reaction. If you were to say, oh, I'm working from home, then people might have had a sideways glance at you. Go, really? We're working from home, what does that look like? Um, it, was, it was, you know, probably passively accepted as being the right thing to do, but we all attended work. It was a different version of kind of going to school. In terms of workplace, we all fell into not so much a trap, but we fell into an environment where leaders, managers, we manage time and attendance. And that's kind of now gone out the window. We're actually now managing outcomes, which is probably the holy grail. As I said, and sorry, as Yasmin said, and how we were looking at this talk, we've been catapulted, fast forwarded into the future. When would we imagine, I saw a piece uh, last night on television, when would we imagine that a professional services firm would have taken out accommodation in a city and they could house 2,000 people in it? Yeah, there's only 150 people at the minute working in it, but they're still offering the services, they're still delivering their product. And we are too, and I'm sure all of you have joined the call today have too. And it's giving us a new perspective on what the art of the possible can be and we're about managing outcomes because we can't see people coming in and out in offices. We can't challenge them. We can't say, where have you been? You can't say what you're doing. Let's have a look at, let's check your homework. We're having to be forced to manage outcomes. Now, when we look at that, we have to reflect on what does that mean for Britain? Because we've got cities. We've got the high street, and we'll come on to that in a second. We've got places of social engagement, nature, we're human beings, we meet each other, we look each other in the eye. 
we're not programmed instinctively to work remotely, yet we have very, very, and I'm sure everyone on this call will, will perhaps agree, we've fallen very naturally into home working and remote working. Once we get a grip of the technology, old duffers like me, <laughs> I mean, I'm 59, uh, 60 next year, where did that come from? We were always sort of grappling and grasping with technology. How can that work? And the higher up you go in the organization, the probably the less and less you need it because you generally, if you're doing your job correctly, you achieve success through others. You recruit the right people. People ask me what my main job is. My main job is cooking, putting the right people in the right jobs. And the higher up you go in an organization, if you've got the, uh, the wrong person, the wrong job, the bigger effect that it can have usually because uh, key decisions tend to be, you know, and it can't be right, it can't be wrong. Key decisions tend to gravitate upwards, although I like to prefer if key, key decisions can be divested into where the, the decisions are, 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 most, uh, are most relevant. But you look at how that's affected people. We, we as an organization are also putting in things like, you know, we are here because there's a, a psychological effect. When the, the blurred lines between where you get up in the morning, where you sleep, and then it's three steps or downstairs or, or wherever to make a cup of coffee or to get a shower, and then it's another three steps to go to your work. That all has a, a psychological effect on people. So we do have in our organization, a, kind of a We Are Here program where people have got the opportunity to talk privately about how they're feeling. And I think that's another aspect of what and how we're reshaping you know, nine to five. And obviously nine to five, well, what does that mean? Do I go to my homework at nine and do I, I leave at five? Or again, does it become blurred and you just end up working 24 hours a day and sleeping none or whatever? So there's all these unintended consequences that we're all wrestling with. And you look at office blocks and headquarters and do we need headquarters and do we need as many people in there and back office? And it comes back to this managing outcomes. And I'm sure everyone who is on this call today will be experiencing smaller office environments, either physically or the people that are coming in, tag teaming. And we're adapting. And that's, again, another slide that we'll come on to because we're human beings and it's about nature. So if you look at what the future can bring to us, and, what, and I come back to nature, because nature is something that I think I almost feel I know that the COVID-19 pandemic is about nature and nature works very slowly. This is not a new thing. Um, flu is a very mild version of the same strain of virus, but it's a virus that needs a host and then it aggressively tries to live in that host. But it, we have become very aware of nature. And then within that, we're looking at well, how can we stop polluting our planet? And what does that mean for transportation? We as an organization, a big part of our organization, the key pillar of our organization is steelmaking. And steelmaking need not be a really, really nasty smokestack polluting industry as some may see it. We've got multiple steel plants around the world that are driven by what are called electric arc furnaces. And if you look at backing Britain, and if we could persuade those in power and in office in our country, if we could persuade them to come alive to green steel, why do I say green steel? As a country, we consume 10 million tons of steel a year. That's what we consume. And guess what? We generate 10 million tons of scrap a year. So why can't we melt that scrap to provide the steel for our needs. That way, steel stops being a headline in our newspapers about job losses, about our contracting industry, and it is talked about as a sustainable industry. So all of a sudden it becomes a green industry. And because the steel industry is a large consumer of electricity, and again, as an organization, we have power generation facilities and they're green, and if I give you an example, as we have the only aluminium smelter in the UK in Fort William, that's again, the making of aluminium is high, high electricity usage. But that electricity is supplied by hydro stations. And we have a dam that holds the water that drives the hydro station that provides the smelter with electricity. So all of a sudden, we're using aluminium that is green 
and is not of a polluting nature. And aluminium in itself is highly recyclable. 95% of all the aluminium in the world is still in existence. So there you have a green metal strategy from an industrial perspective that I would love to be able to persuade our governments to really, really absorb and grasp and, and be passionate about because it could solve the future of our country's uh, steel making and aluminium making future. And that's an example in heavy industry. If you look at the vehicle where we, they got a lot of press and, you know, and who knows where the truth lies, but the informed wisdom at the minute is that we are heading for an electric future. Now, I'm not so sure that that is where we're heading. I think electric is the, and all electric is, I have a hybrid car. Um, and I think hybrid is, is where, where it's at, but whether it's a hydrogen driven fuel cell or a very efficient single gear, single rev, small engine that's charging a battery. But what we do know is, is that our electric vehicles, our hybrid vehicles, our hydrogen driven vehicles will be part of our future. And mobility and motability will become a different part of our life. Instead of buying a car and higher purchase, I mean, car companies allegedly make a lot of their profits out of the finance packages that they sell you. They don't make so much money on the cars themselves. And the way we buy cars or own cars or operate cars may change, may have to change. If you think about trying to charge the UK fleet of cars in a 20 year ahead future, where is all those, how and where are all these charging stations going to appear from? And where are we going to get the electricity from? Because we're a net importer of electricity. So we have to start generating more electricity to provide the electricity to drive the electric cars. And all these things are being fast forwarded towards us. And I think why? Because we are becoming very aware what COVID has done is becoming and reminded us of nature and our connection to our planet and how affected we can be to what and where we are in the organization and the cause and effect that we have in our daily lives. And we are very aware. You know, we seem to be getting hotter and hotter spells and rainier and rainier spells. Is that just coincidence? It's stopping us to think and stopping us to pause. Jasmine, next uh, slide, please. And something that has paused, perhaps, is the high street. Thousands of jobs are going every day, it seems. Household names that were part of my childhood, trips into Glasgow, it was more of a destiny. If, you know, what was shopping? Was it actually going to buy something you needed or was it a, a day out? Was it a, a change of scene? Um, the way shopping, the way the high street has been part of our social and economical life has changed, is changing and will change. And it is a big part of Britain. You know, the, the, you look at pictures that we've got in our country of high streets, Cotswold high streets, of, of, of Highland villages or, or, or villages in Del Devon and Cornwall, and you don't get so much of them in places like America. They're, they're different, but our high street is very much a national, we call it a national treasure perhaps. But what does it look like in the future? We go down the high street today and it seems to be full of charity shops, closed doors, and COVID and everything around it has accelerated our need for online shopping. I, I would, if the people in this webinar today were part of the national survey, 80 to 90%, if I was doing this talk in front of you as an audience, it's, it's probably a hands up moment. And I'd probably say hands up everybody who's bought something online in the last 24 hours. And it would probably be 80% of the hands would go up. It's part of our life now. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. The unintended consequence of that is that it's had an impact on the high street. But the high street is part of our national heritage. It's what it's, it, it forms part of. I, I live in Solihull in the West Midlands. It's got a town centre. It's got a high street. The high street is now pedestrianised. And it looks a lot different to a black and white picture of what it might look like in the 1960s. So we have to think about what the high street will look like. We don't want to lose it, but it will have to change because more of us will be doing online shopping. There's a crisis in confidence, you know, going into a shop and maybe wanting to spend money, don't know if you're going to have your job. So you'll just, and you then now can't go to the high street because you might be on lockdown. If you're in Aberdeen, you, you can't go today. But when you shop online, generally what you want is there. And generally you can get it next day. 
So for me, um, a part of backing Britain is backing our high street, but we have to change what it looks like. Is it coffee shops? Is it a place where we gather? Is it a place where we go to socialise? Is it somewhere that can and still offer services like hair salons, nail bars, dry cleaning? You know, those things you can't get online. You can't get a haircut online. You know, so um, it's really we have to not give up on a high street, but we have to really focus on how we change it. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, Now this, I come back to nature. You know, and the pandemic hasn't treated everyone with equal fear. It's, it's a virus. It finds a host. I'm, I'm lucky enough, my wife is an ex-staff nurse, so she knows far more about this. So I'm a very much a, a bar room expert now, but a virus find, needs to find a host. When it finds its host, it needs to survive. But if it's an aggressive virus, it can kill its host and my uh, condolences to anyone in the audience who has we have suffered a tragedy in our not immediate but in our wider family we lost uh, a relative to COVID so my condolences to anyone in the audience who who has uh, suffered in, in that regard but the virus finds a host and this one has been aggressive it's first step I'm an ex-footballer as I said so it's first step on the pitch is it's really aggressive it tackles really hard and it has killed. It's picked the loaf hanging fruit first, the elderly, those of ethnic minority who we've seen through uh, data and research have been more susceptible. That has been, again, a sad thing to see against the data, but it will, it will develop, it will mutate, and it will come back again. Flu doesn't go away, it comes back every year. This will come back every year. And it won't be business as usual, it will be crisis as usual. And as business leaders and in the backing Britain, big topic that's in our entry, we have to look at crisis as usual and how we're going to respond when it comes back again, because it will start to go in to the wider demographic. Um, it will, it will it come back aggressively? Will it come back as a, as, as a slightly less uh, aggressive strain? People, in less economic developed areas have suffered greater because we don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the hospitals. And that's, again, we're all becoming more aware of that. We're all becoming socially aware of it, we're all becoming more global citizens because we are seeing something that we're all suffering from, suffering that we're all in together. In the week before lockdown, we all thought it was, it was something that came from China, the Italians, yeah, they got it bad, but it'll never happen in Britain. You know, we all, I think, suffered a bit of that, but by God has it happened. It's something that the world has shared and we all share together. And again, we can use that as part of our response. And we need to use that to adapt. Um, it has exposed economic weakness. It, exposed, it has exposed business weaknesses. But again, it's that fast forward. Perhaps that business was already weak. Perhaps that, perhaps that country was already weak. It's also brought into sharp focus things that need to be done in certain areas because they're right in front of us and we can't get away from it. Next slide, please. Now, this slide, I think perhaps, you know, this is one that we should probably just dwell and pause on because it kind of revolves around everything that we've, we've, been, walk, we've been watching the government and I kind of trying to think of a metaphor or, a, or a, a picture, a mind picture that the government's like in a boxing ring and we are the crowd and they're fighting COVID, you know, and there's round one, there's round two and there's a lot of criticism in the government and you know I, I don't know what success looks like I, I know what success looks like in business um, I've had why because I've had my failures so I know what success looks like but I don't think there's any playbook for this so I'm in the camp for what it's worth of just give the government a break they're doing their best um, yes they've made mistakes um, but they're in the white and open glare of public opinion and public account um, what we should do is look at how we respond the next time. Where are the lessons? You know, what can we do better? What should we be doing better? But the way that we've responded to this COVID pandemic is really around, there's two sides to it. That's what we can do as a country to back Britain into the future. And that's very, very important because we're heading for Brexit. And backing Britain 
has to be top of the agenda because we are going to be more than in many ways an island again. We're an island by geography. We are an island economy, but we are linked. We're not moving. We're not moving the island. The island is still next to Europe. And you cannot really change the three trillion pounds of trade that you can't just stop that overnight. But how that, the trends of how that can grow or how that may wane or how that may suffer is what we're in control of. It's not going to switch off overnight, but what happens to the trends over time is what we can control. Now, one thing that I would like to see um, in terms of big government is an industrial strategy. If you take the colour out of whatever government is in power, whether it's red, blue or yellow, or a mix of all three or one or two at any one time, we need an industrial strategy that transcends government. It transcends time. I am biased, there's, I'm sure many people in the audience today from different sectors, travel, hospitality, logistics, but I'm in manufacturing, I'm in industry, I'm in engineering, I'm in power generation. We need to make engineering a profession that really, really, really is valued. That starts with education, that starts with teachers, it starts with an industrial strategy that I say will transcend government. And then when manufacturing, everything is made, everything around us, this computer that I'm sitting in front of is made. The watch that I'm keenly looking at so that I don't overrun my time and Yasmin starts shouting at me is manufactured. The suit I'm wearing is manufacturing, the shoes I'm wearing, the desk I'm sitting at, the car I drove to this office, everything is manufactured. So manufacturing engineering needs to be high on the agenda of aspirational careers and professions and not consigned to perhaps a second choice or a, or, or a choice of topic that isn't accounting law and other and, and, and doctors which are eminent and needed and highly regarded professions. Engineering needs to sit right up there with them. We get that right and we get an industrial strategy right, then all this money we've been spending um, will come to bear I believe but how do we pay for it well the unintended consequence and I keep using that word unintended consequence because we're in a new paradigm we have no playbook for this everything is a new experience we've got some experiences that that help us but everything is a new experience and we're learning all the way hopefully we're writing it all down or memorizing it or putting it in our experience but we'll all re like we remember when JFK was shot like we remember when uh, Diana lost her life in the tunnel, like we remember the financial crisis, we'll remember the 23rd of March 2020. And it's how we respond now, but how do we pay for all this borrowing? You know, I try to get away, whilst I work in the, the world of big industry and, and high finance, I try and get away from the mumbo jumbo sometimes. And the reality is that we have got a contracting economy because we're making people redundant, shops are closing, factories are not doing so well, there's less corporation tax, so there's less income tax, there's less income for the government in the short term, yet it's borrowing more and more money and there's no choice to smooth the road for a path out of this crisis and it's that path out and where it's heading is the important thing. The reality is, I fear we're consigning the next generation for high inflation in the future, as capacity contracts, as money supply will contract, inflation will come. I'm not an expert in macroeconomics. At some point, you, you observe on you know, big spending. It's like America. I was once told uh, a story about uh, metaphorically, like if you go away on holiday and you're living next to a sewage works and you come back from holiday and your house is up to the rafters with sewage, the sewage plant has, has, has had an accident and your house now is full of sewage. What do you do? Do you pump out the sewage or do you raise the roof? And that seems to be the, the idea of big government borrowing. Let's just keep raising the roof. Let's keep borrowing more money. Um, let's co continue to issue government bonds. Now, a bond is a promise to pay money back and to pay interest in the meantime until the day you've paid it back. So like we borrowed huge amounts of money after the Second World War, they eventually had to be paid back. And I think that they... They, they weren't paid back until the 1970s or 80s, ultimately. We're in the same position. So we are consigning the next generations to the prospect of higher taxes and higher inflation. There's no getting away from it. I'm not, not a macroeconomic expert, but if I just look at simple finance, if you borrow money, it has to be paid back. Now, if a government say, well, a government can't really go bankrupt 
but it can default on debts. And if it defaults on debts, then the bonds that it's issued or issues in the future, the interest rates are higher because it's a higher risk from people who want to invest in the bonds that that country is asking for again. So again, that leads to, uh, to a difficult and can, um, quite a, you know, a difficult economic situation. So I think what you have to do, in my view, um, I just look at life. How do you become successful in life? We need to get up every day and get started. Go to work, carry on, go to bed, get up next morning, carry on, work, keep going. We have no choice but to keep going. And I think in terms of backing Britain, we have to just keep going. Um, we have borrowed a lot of money. We are going to continue to borrow a lot of money, but we have to keep going. And the manufacturing and the income generators that we are remained with, we have to keep going. Next slide, please. So this one, I think, has really come home to roost. Globalization of supply chains has been a necessity. We as consumers, we all expect more and more for less and less. You look at the car you drive, you look at the you look at the possessions you have around you, you look at what you pay for them, and, and there's this, I almost shiver every time as an industrialist and someone who runs economic enterprises for profit to be reinvested in a business, to employ more people, to create economic activity and social stability. When I hear and see things like cut price and, 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 you know, and, and everything is, 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 is so cheap, then ultimately we are skinning out the margins in my view, for what's worth, sadly, the automotive supply chain is a, is, a, is, a big, uh, is a big part of this. As consumers, we want more and more of a car for less and less and less. The OEM, the manufacturers, they thin out the supply chain. The margins are very thin. The supply chains get stretched, become very thin. And if you've got something that's very thin and very stretched, it doesn't take much to snap it and cut it. If it it's a bit like a country road versus a motorway. It's very easy to have a traffic jam on a country road. It's, <laughs> you may disagree, it's not so easy to have a traffic jam on a motorway. But let's just say if you do have an accident on one uh, part of the motorway, traffic can still flow. Perhaps a bad metaphor, <laughs> but I'm sure you know what I'm trying to say. But these thin lines of supply have really, really been exposed by COVID. Now, back in Britain, and the COVID pandemic, I think, has brought into sharp focus the need for Go Global Think Local. We need more suppliers in the UK supplying our world-class industries, and we need them close to us, and we need them on this island. That makes the supply chain short, that makes it more robust, and that makes it more sustainable. And if the, 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 the aircraft parts maker or the aircraft maker and the automaker have their suppliers close to them, then that will stand the test of time. If you, we've all got, I think something like 30% of all products made have either a part made in them from China or a supplier of that supplier is a part made of in China. And China is thousands and thousands of miles away. Yet if that part is made 20 miles away from your factory, then it is a better chance of surviving a crisis that we've just gone through in the future. So I think, you know, the aspect of go global, think local is real. Yes diversification and globalization has its merits, but we have gone too far. And the COVID crisis has exposed it and exposed it quite dramatically. Even when we looked at how we responded to the pandemic on the, um, the COVID crisis with the, the, the PPE, we saw how supply chains can be really hemorrhaged very quickly. So we really need to think carefully about what our supply chains look like in the future. Next slide, please, Yasmin. So as we kind of come towards wrapping up today, the last mile, now this is where huge opportunities lie, I think. You know, you've got these big warehouses that are sitting next to motorways. You could put three Hamden parks. That's a Scottish football ground to those who don't know it. <laughs> I think uh, Scotland beat England there. 2-1 in 1978, I had to get that in there. But let's just say you can get five Wembleys, eight Wembleys, you can get 10 San Siro's into some of these um, big warehouses, but they don't deliver your goods. It's that last mile is where the service is. And we as an organization are very closely looking at how do we grab that customer who's the ultimate user. You're the ultimate, ultimate consumer of food, but the supply chain of where that potato or that parsnip was grown has got three or four key steps to it. But the last mile, the supermarket to your fridge, 
the last mile your Amazon order to your house, the last mile of that home delivery service is where you get the most activity growth. Amazon, Walmart, I think we're, we're, we're hiring 300,000 people over the, the March, April period. So there's a business opportunity there. Logistics companies, um, I think, have got a huge opportunity. Technology companies have a huge opportunity. It's a boom time. Um, as, we, as, as the things that are left behind as we come out and go forward from this crisis and manage the next version of it, there are huge opportunities in how you manage that last mile and how you retain your customers and how you serve them better. Because what the COVID crisis is doing is it's asking us all to be three clicks, asking all business to be three clicks away from a customer. You know, the, the days of browsing and, and talking on the phone and stuff, those are over. If you can't do it in three clicks, you move on. And that's the sad, again, the word I've used a lot, unintended consequence of the COVID pandemic. We think we do things online, we order it, and we, do, we want it delivered, and we can generally get it delivered the next day. And that's the world we're living in. So again, logistics and customer service, and Britain being an island, and there's, there's nothing that you can't really get to anywhere else, I think, in the UK, I read an article once, within 24 hours, unless you maybe live in Wick or some outer lying outer Hebrides Island. But generally in mainland Britain, if you order something, or if you start somewhere, you can generally get it to the next place within 24 hours. So all of that really talks to a backing Britain scenario. And, you know, we need to get the Union Jack over a lot of these things um, because what's coming very quickly is Brexit. So if I wrap up backing Britain, um, one thing I didn't tell you about is in my career in the Navy, I used to come home and and leave and I was part of mountain rescue in Scotland and we were taught how to rescue people. I use that in business quite a lot in rescuing situations, res re rescuing um, businesses, etc. And it's called PIDADA as I call it in my head as an acronym, but it's panic, denial, anger, depression, acceptance. When we first hit COVID, the world panicked, stock market crashed. Um, you get through, those who survive go very quickly from panic to acceptance. There's a new paradigm, there's, everything's changed, we need to get on with it. We've suffered adversity, but we can't live in that adverse situation. We can't accept that adversity. We have to move on. So we have to go through. Sadly, it's a bit like grieving, but in a business response, you've got to these business and all businesses, as we back Britain, we've got to get to acceptance. The world is not, there's not going to be a business as usual, I think, for a long time. We're all trying to predict what is coming around the corner. But there are going to be lower volumes. There is going to be less demand. There are going to be various opportunity in tech and software and logistics that we talked about. And other areas, um, travel industry has been hit horribly. But as Churchill said, we mustn't waste a crisis. I hesitate to use the word opportunity when there's so, been so much tragedy captured in this pandemic. But don't waste a crisis. We will be more efficient. We can be better businesses. It has fast forwarded the future right into our entry. Anyone who's in business leadership is right in front of us. And we all suffer adversity in life. Everybody does, personally and in their business careers. But it's how we respond to it, how we respond to it, that's what defines us. We have an appointment with history. Britain has an appointment with history. We're through, we're halfway through, we're dealing with COVID, but we do have an appointment with history on Brexit. And we can't miss that appointment. We all want the great and good things for Britain. But we've got to make them happen. And we either do it or we don't. Thank you for listening. Yasmin, over to you. Great, thank you for that, uh, Douglas. Really, really great speech there. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen, guys, and then we'll get to onto this Q&A section. There we are. Sorry, we ran a wee bit over. We just got to 40 minutes, but... Um, so. That's absolutely fine. Uh, we have many, many members engaged today, so um, we'll get through these questions uh, as quickly as possible. Hopefully you guys can stick around for a couple more minutes if we do run over. So um, our first question comes from Hope Miller, and she asks, given we are now in a recession, how do, you, how do we see the manufacturing industry moving forward in terms of investment on equipment and investments? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a it's a great question and it's also a horrible question. Um, I mean, my job, anyone in a business leadership role who, or, or even in a small business, um, where you're signing off on a capital expenditure request or a, or a, or a, or a, or a decision to spend capital, um, is a big decision at the minute. You know, it comes back to the cash is king and everyone is using cash to survive as opposed to using cash to invest. And any cash that you do have probably is borrowed and needs to be paid back. But I think if you try and look around the corner, um, I think the, to answer the question is, we, we have to try and look around the corner. So not invest for today, but look around the corner of the future and see and try and predict what the future's like. And, and, and try, you know, and there's a balance, you know, you're looking at cash and, the, and it's not much point investing in a business if, it, if it's not there. So you need the cash to survive and you need the profitability to survive. But I think we do need to continue to invest. Uh, I think it will take longer to make those decisions because it has to be thought through more carefully. But certainly as an organization, we're still investing. We're still, and again, in a business leadership role, I would sort of answer that finally. As, as long as you can look around the corner of what you think the future might hold and you feel that confidence that that investment will give you some returns, then we, sh we have to keep going. You know, we, we, we can't stop investing. Great, thanks that, Douglas, and um, really positive outlook there, so thank you. Um, so our next question comes from Guy Char Chartres, sorry if I've pronounced it incorrectly, um, and Guy says, hello Douglas, how excited are you by the U Usk Mouth conversion project being ran by the Simic Atlantis Energy? Again, apologies, <laughs> pronounced anything wrong there. Uh, so, we'll, so we'll quickly redo the, uh, thank you for that, because it gives me the opportunity to, to, to do the, uh, to do the pronunciation correctly. So that's the Uskmouth Power Station um, on the River Usk, and it's uh, run by CIMEC, um, which is a part of our global um, GFG Alliance uh, uh, grouping. Um, that's a great opportunity because what that does is you've got a coal fire power station that's been decommissioned and has been put on the naughty step, um, effectively, which and quite rightly so. But to repurpose that power station to be burning uh, renewable fuel pellets, biofuel fuel pellets, is a huge opportunity for the world because the thing that these big coal fire power stations that are being uh, closed down, if we can repurpose them, the thing that these big power stations have is, is they have infrastructure, they have grid connection, and they have generating capacity. So if we can convert that power station, then all of a sudden we've got another 300 or 200, sorry, 200 megawatts of, of, of power generation that can go into the grid. And that's great news for a country like ours. It's a net importer of electricity. We're not a net exporter. We used to be, but we're a net importer. So we are power poor. So, so uh, and then if you could take that technology around the world, um, and our fuel pellets have received approval um, in Japan. So we're well on the way to, to making this uh, a, viable, uh, a viable and deliverable project. If we can perfect that, then that's a huge opportunity for the world to repurpose coal-fired power stations. Great, thanks for that, Douglas. Um, so we've had quite a few, a few questions come in now, um, so we'll try and do them as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our next uh, question comes from Paul Bayuchamp, and he asks, will the alloy wheel plant at Loch uh, Barra go, go ahead? Uh, so that's alloy. This is great for the pronunciation. So that's at Loch Arbor, but if you're not Scottish, it's a difficult one. Um, so we um, we embarked on. Uh, was the question, will it go ahead, or I didn't didn't quite get the question. Yep. So will the will it uh, will it go ahead exactly? Will the alloy wheel go ahead? So there's two questions in one there. The, the purpose of investing in the alloy wheel plant was to use the aluminium in our smelter for downstream production and protect and create jobs in the highlands. That is not, we are not undiminished in that objective. We've paused for thought on whether it will be an alloy wheel plant or not, but we've got other plans approved to do other products that achieve the same outcome. So, so in terms of the outcome that's desired for building an alloy wheel plant, um, that's a yes. Whether it will be an alloy wheel plant or whether it will be extrusions or whether it will be aluminium billet or other products, that's pause for thought and undecided at the minute because, as you would imagine, with the economic climate, what we don't want to do is build field of dreams, as in build a factory to do one thing, but then there's no market for it. So, so the outcome is, is a yes, that's undiminished. How we get there, 
we're just pausing for thought. Great, thanks for that, Douglas. And um, hopefully on these next few questions, I can pronounce all of the words That's correctly. your test, that's your yeah. test. As long as you don't get any Scottish and Welsh names, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, so um, our next question comes from um, Alan Joyce, who said, uh, David mentioned the, sorry, I think he's meant to say Douglas there. So Douglas mentioned right. the, we are here, the, the we are here process for staff support. Can he give any insight to the types of issues the staff are raising? Um, yeah, so I wish I had a pound for every time someone, at least it wasn't Duncan or Donald, because every time anyone hears a Scottish accent, they go to Duncan or Donald. And so uh, David's a new one, I like that. Um, so the we are here, so it's really around uh, just trying to make people, you know, the worst thing about um, you know the, what goes in between your ears is that you keep it to yourself and it stays between if it stays between your ears and if you're feeling concerned or anxious or you're feeling stressed about working at home you know because because working at home is not easy you know I, I was in a meeting the other day and we were discussing a really difficult topic and this chap was defend he was on the other side of the table it was a professional meeting and he's defending his position and he's he's in full flow and he's he's really into his topic and then the door creaks open behind him and he goes dad you know <laughs> you know and, he, and it just you know he just and we all just laughed but that's stressful you know and you know, we laughed at the moment, but he couldn't do his job for the company that he was representing, you know, and so it's, it's all around giving people the opportunity to have an outlet, a private and confidential outlet for these concerns, these frustrations and, and, and you know, just a whole manner of things. But it's just giving that out, that, that, that sort of outlet and that way of, of sharing, because the paradox of, of where we are as a world is that we're we're all working from home and, and the government are doing their best. We're all trying to achieve solidarity when we're actually trying to isolate ourselves. And, and that's a huge paradox. And, and we've got to bridge that gap. So that's, um, that's why we are here is here and, and just excuse the pun. And hopefully people will just take that step, not be embarrassed about it and just talk through things that are just, you know, upsetting or frustrating them. Great, thanks for that, Douglas. Um, so we we can probably go for a couple more minutes now. So we can try and get two more two more questions answered. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go for John Hawke's question, who says, "How does Liberty Liberty Group view Industry Four, and how does how does it have a digitalisation strategy?" Yeah, no, it's. I think it's about you know the COVID crisis and the title of the talk. You know, we'll be fast forwarded to the future. Is, is very relevant. It's a, it's a great question on top of that. So a digital, you talk about digital factory or, or a digital future. We're using digital platform to communicate. Um, to give you a worked example, we are, as part of our technology, one of our technology companies is, has launched a new product called Aquila, which came from, we've, we've done autonomous vehicle controls for cars and movies you know the stunts are getting so complex and difficult now that you can't have stunt drivers so it's all done by autonomous vehicles and we make all the controls for a lot of the films that you see in all these car chases and stuff but the technology in that we've now taken into industry so from a, a health and safety point of view you can embed a crane and a forklift truck and you can put a, a sensor on the back of someone's hard hat or their high-vis jacket and you've got proximity sensors uh, sensors so the forklift truck will automatically stop before the you know before the person comes into their to, to their, their their sort of line of sight. Um, so that's a way of that we're developing technology to promote health and safety for our, our employees. And obviously, everyone is becoming more digitally aware now, even myself. So when someone says, "Oh, we'll have a Teams call," it's just boom, yeah, do 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 three clicks in your your meeting set up. Four months ago, I was scratching my head and phoning my IT department, but. Um, it is going to be a, a necessary step to be more connected as less and less um, you know people are trying to do more and more things as the economy starts to try and get better and better and for whatever of a better phrase get back to some sense of, of normal but I think the big plus is is that I would say the majority of people in an organization are, are now digitally aware because they have to be and I think that will transcend into every organization's future. 
Great, thank you for that, Douglas. Um, so we just have time for one more question today. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for everybody for sticking around. Um, Catherine, you did submit two questions, but I, I'm going to read out the one that I think I liked best. So um, this this question comes did from... You, can uh, you pronounce that one? Is that why? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that, but um, I just thought this question was a lot better. So this Good. one comes from Catherine Rose, uh, and she says, biofuel pellets could separate could separating our food waste from our food wrapper waste and having a separate food waste collection, like the recycling collection, produce enough raw materials for biofuel pellets to reduce the UK's need to import fuel from abroad? Well, the answer has got to be yes. Um, it's these, but it's, a, it's an emerging technology. Emer well, it's old technology, but it's transforming and becoming. And it's the old story of going from niche to volume to commodity. And again we have to be disciplined you know when you think of the amount of waste product you no know, we're now very it's now a way of life it starts in your kitchen i've got four bins in the kitchen and it's ding 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 and that's natural so i think as the world coalesces around it's our job to prove the technology to repurpose the power plant to make it something that everybody sees in the news and becomes proud about in terms of back in britain and once that becomes part of everyone's daily life, then it's like when I was talking about green steel, we've got 800 million tonnes of scrap already in the system, but we just haven't turned it to scrap yet in the UK. It's, it's someone's washing machine, it's someone's old car. You know, it's, it's a factory that's lying derelict somewhere with steel girders. So, so, so the actual raw material and the feedstock's already there. And in terms of biofuel, it's already there. The world just needs to align itself to create the supply chains and the recycling chains to get it there. And, and obviously technology, like everything, the early adopters and technology sometimes at the beginning can be a bit clunky, but as things become more refined, things become, it's like range, range anxiety in electric cars. It won't be long before electric cars will, will go for 600 miles. You know, it, it's, it's just, uh, it's a case of the, the gap between early adoption and and, and mainstream uh, manufacturing, but the, the absolute answer is yes. Great, thank you for that, Douglas. And it's well, been my pleasure. Um, it's been another another great event and a perfect one to round it off, really. And uh, it, 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 it's uh, quite a shame now that these, this is our last event um, of the exhibition. And um, you've been a great speaker. And thank you again for taking part. Oh, my pleasure. So just before uh, you guys leave today, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, we have virtual drinks, our final virtual drinks at 3 p.m. today, where some of our keynote speakers will be attending. Um, Douglas will hopefully be attending as well. So any questions that weren't answered here, you'll have uh, maybe the opportunity to speak to him there. Uh, we also have our banner competition as well. So look for the golden banner uh, amongst our stands at uh, onbackinbritain.com and you have the chance of winning a bottle of wine and uh, a Brompton bike. So um, either or you, you get put into both competitions. So uh, make sure to be part of that as well. But um, thank you again, Douglas, and uh, I hope to see you at virtual drinks later on. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.